and to uh, see what God has for us. Um, tonight we're going to be uh, looking at John chapter number 15 amongst many other scriptures, but the title of tonight's message is God Sees Trees. And so uh, as we get here, um, you can turn in your Bibles to John chapter 15. I will be um, visiting a couple of other scriptures before we actually uh, uh, get there, but I want us to consider this as we consider the title of this God Seeing Trees here. I do want to read to you uh, Genesis chapter number 1 and verse number 11, where the Bible says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And here we find in the very beginning in creation, uh, Genesis chapter number 1, where God uh, creates the trees and the different other plants that are here on the face of the earth today. And specific to the uh, fruit tree here, um, it's going to yield fruit after its kind. And I don't know if how, you know, amazed you guys are still by this today. I remember when I was younger, you open up an orange or an apple and understand that the seed to reproduce that item is actually within itself. That's mind-blowing. And there's so many different uh, things out there that God did that with, and, and they do. They, pr they produce fruit if they're fed properly, right? And so we consider these trees here in the very beginning when God created the world, and they were intended to yield fruit. Genesis chapter 1 and verses 27 and 28, the Bible says, So God created man in His own image, and the image of God created He Him, male and female, created he him and God blessed them and said unto them be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth we consider this time here in Genesis where God did make man in his own image and and he did give him dominion over all of the earth but consider this he told him to be fruitful and multiply. Amen? And when we consider being fruitful, we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight, but you know there's an intent um, for us as human beings to yield good things in our life, fruit for God as we serve Him. And we consider uh, you know, throughout the, the, a, a good deal of the, bo uh, the Bible where uh, God is speaking to different people, um, He does include in there for them to be fruitful. Now, there's a lot of different kind of fruit that's out there, but with that being said, um, God um, has uh, intended for us to be fruitful and to grow fruit in our life. Genesis chapter number 9 and verse number 1, and I'm also going to read verse number 7. Verse number 1 says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. You know, and as we look at some of these things, sometimes we can uh, limit our viewpoint on God's Word by simply thinking that maybe God's saying the same thing three times in a row here. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. But at the end of the day, God wants us to be fruitful. Amen? He desires for us to be fruitful. Verse number 7 of Genesis chapter number 9, the Bible says, And you... Be ye fruitful, and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. And so we consider as God created uh, human beings, He created trees, He created plants. Um, human beings, um, God really desires for us uh, to be fruitful still. Amen? And so, you know, when we consider today John chapter number 15... Let's turn over there, John chapter number 15. This is Jesus speaking here. <clears throat> Verse number 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, I don't know if you really 
understand the pruning or the purging process that goes on with different kind of fruit trees, whether that's apple trees or orange trees or whatever, um, they're all pruned. They're all purged uh, certain times of the year, um, which helps them to yet be more fruitful the next fruit bearing session or season that that tree is going to have. And we consider Jesus here in, in verse number two. Um, he says that the, the branches that are not producing fruit, those ones are cut down and thrown by the wayside. And the ones that are producing fruit are the ones that he purges. And we consider that in itself, you know, as we you know, sometimes think, well, this branch, we're, we're, we're bearing good fruit, and why would he need to purge something that's bearing good fruit? But that's what stimulates the growth of even more fruit. And the ones that are not producing fruit, once again, um, are uh, uh, cast away. We consider this word, purgeth here, as it falls in the uh, dictionary here in the Greek. Um, this is from our Strong's Concordance. Um, and we can take a look here, and the word purgeth only appears one time in the entire Bible. It's found right here in John 15, verse number 2. And the meaning here um, at a high level is to cleanse. Um, katheiro um, is the pronunciation of this Greek word, katheiro, ero. And this is a verb. And this is something that God does for us. It's an action word. And when we consider the, the short definition being to cleanse, when we look down here at the Strong's Concordance, it's to, to purge. Um, it's from katharos, which is a couple of numbers found up above this, but same root word, um, to cleanse, i.e. especially uh, uh, to prune, figuratively to um, expiate, uh, expiate or to purge. Now, when we consider what God is saying here when He wants to purge us, um, he wants to cleanse us. And when we consider this word right here, expiate, has anybody ever heard of that word before being used? Expiate. This word means to atone for guilt or sin. That's what that word expiate means. To put that in a sentence, their sins must be expiated by sacrifice. The fact, sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as we consider the cleansing, the initial cleansing that took place in our lives and the purging from sin as we came to recognize Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But furthermore, as we consider the purging here, there's a constant purging or cleansing that Jesus Christ wants to do in our lives and, and in our bodies. And you know, as we grow closer to Christ, as we learn more about Him, we can then understand the things that He would have us to do in a, in a broader and greater sense, therefore um, moving us to action, helping us to show um, our love for God. But God purges us. And so to consider this verse again, verse number 2, um, uh, and every branch that beareth fruit, He purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Do you think purging feels very good? Sometimes purging doesn't feel very good in the Christian life when we're talking the spiritual realm. Uh, purging is to uh, remove those things that are taking preeminence from the greater good away from all the others. You know, if you look at some of the diagrams around trees and how to purge trees, um, they always show random uh, stalks or branches taking off in their own direction, um, really trying to be the leader, if you will, of that whole entire tree. Um, they're known as sometimes rogue branches, sometimes leader branches. Um, but, you know, to consider that God is going to purge us so that we can bring forth more fruit. And sometimes it's not going to feel very good because He's going to be taking things out of our life or transforming us by the renewing of our mind as we study His Word so that we'll start to think more like Him and our life will begin to change for Him because of what He's done for us and what He's said in our Word or in His Word and He'll begin to purge us. You know, an easy purging for us as believers is learning something from the preaching or the reading of the Word of God or the teaching of the Word of God and then simply executing and doing what God says right away. That's an easy way to go as far as purging. That's the least pain uh, uh, that's going to be you know, put on us as believers. 
But for those that choose not to do that and to be thick-skinned or hard-headed or stiff-necked or whatever, however you want to say it, um, the individual chooses not to follow the direction of God right away, well, then the purging is going to be a little more painful as you get down the road. Because as we choose to go away that's not pleasing to God, there are many things that begin to enter into our lives that intertwine um, into these rogue branches, if you will, in our own will and living in our own way. And sometimes, you know what? Uh, God needs to purge us. And I'll say this too. Trees that are perfectly healthy and good and producing plenty of fruit still get purged also. <laughs> you know that, right? <laughs> So the purging is not exclusive to just those that live in this world that are uh, believers that um, maybe have some, some things going on in their lives that God needs to change. It happens for everybody, all of God's children. He's constantly working on us so that we will conform to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. And as we consider you know, this place where uh, Jesus here is talking about the branches being purged, He goes on to say this, verse number 3, Now ye are clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in Me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. Nor can ye, except ye abide in Me." So even as we consider ourselves as you know, looking at the title of this message here, God Sees Trees, He expects for us to bear fruit. We are not rogue trees like we saw in the very first slide tonight. We are not a forest of trees like this. As believers in Jesus Christ, we are grafted into the true vine. Amen? And even though uh, God can look down upon us and expect us to bear fruit, it's only because we're grafted into the true vine, Jesus Christ, then we can bear fruit that's pleasing to Him. But it's our choice if we want to be in that position. Amen? He goes on to say here in verse number 4, um, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except ye abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Jesus reiterates to us once again that you know he is going to purge us. He is going to prune us. But if we choose to get far away from Him, we need to remember this, without Him we cannot do anything. I know we sometimes allow our own minds and our own flesh to take over where we think we're the smartest thing since the creator of the bread slicing machine, right? But we're not. We can't do anything without Him. We're low down, no good creatures that God created with you know, sinful behaviors. We're prone for sin. You know, you wonder why there's so much turmoil in the world. There are some people out there today preaching that, well, when uh, there becomes a, a higher and higher level of peace in the world, that's when God's going to come back. The world is consistently getting better and better and better and better until the time God comes back. That's not true. I'm sorry, it's not true. It's not biblical, but it's not true as we look at history either. People are always going to not get along with, another, with one another. They're always going to be trying to kill each other. It doesn't matter what the, what the issue is. It's just like when we were in grade school in the sandbox, the teacher or the recess PE monitor or whatever may come out and solve the issue with you on what's going on, but a few moments later, that little girl's going to start crying about something else. Not even related to what. That way, the other issue's fixed. But now something else is on their heart and they're going to create all kinds of turmoil. And you know, man, kids are great for seeing things like that, aren't they? But you know what? We can get to the place where we start acting like that as adults too. Amen? And that's not good for us to be there. Without Jesus Christ, we cannot do anything. Verse number 6, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch um, and as withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. That's for each one of us that are here today. We're, it's required of us to bear much fruit. We're supposed to do that. And so as God looks down on us as, as trees, if you will, engrafted into His uh, Son, Jesus Christ, He ought to see fruit growing there. 
Otherwise, you know what he's going to see? Some scrawny little puny stick hanging off there. Because everything's been hacked off. Now I know the place right here that we just read through that talks about uh, you know, the, the, the ones that don't abide and the branches will be uh, thrown into the fire. I know we're talking about salvation and, and whatnot, but I'm just saying as we consider this tree, um, God's going to prune us. And you've all seen that tree that somebody's trying to save that's not been producing fruit in years. It turns into that stick in the backyard. It stops growing things. There's no way to prune it after a while. And you know what? The human hearts that we have beating within our chest, they're deceitful and desperately wicked. And if we don't give that thing over to God, we're going to be that little withered up stick. As, and as God looks down upon us hoping to see fruit, fruit that will glorify the Father, He may look down and just see some scrawny withered up stick that's just barely hanging on to life. That's not the life He intended for us though. Amen? Not by any means at all. But He does expect for us uh, to bear fruit. We should be growing fruit. And so as we consider what Jesus says there and, and looking at the real meaning of uh, the purging that goes on there, cleansed, even from that very point of salvation where Jesus Christ died for our sins, understand this, the master gardener that is doing the purging the master gardener that is doing the pruning, he is the one that went to the cross and died for us. He is the one that healed the blind man. He is the one that healed the leper. He is the one that healed the man lame of palsy. He is the one that healed the man that was there by the pool of Bethsaida. He is the one that healed the, the blind man by scooping up clay uh, using the, the original equipment, if you will, right? The dirt and fixing up his eyes for him. This is the one that's doing the purging. Don't forget that. Because so often... You know, we're not like trees in the sense that trees can kind of stand there and they're only going to get moved as they're shaken by the wind. You know what human beings have the tendency to do as God tries to prune them? We have the ability to move. And we have the ability to make a decision to do what we want to do. And sometimes the Holy Spirit of God will speak to us. And you know, a lot of pruning is done uh, through that process as God helps to change our mind as we get involved with Scripture and we hear from the Lord. And the Holy Spirit puts some things on our heart confirming what's in the Word of God. But we have the choice to do what we're going to do at the end of the day. Amen? So the question is, what kind of fruit will you yield? There's all kinds of fruit in the Bible. There's a lot of it. <clears throat> the fruit of the, room, the womb. Genesis chapter 30 and verse number 2 says, And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in God's stead who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? It's talking about her being childless here in Genesis 30 verse 2. But the child that would be there is called the fruit of the womb. Amen? Psalm 127 and verse number 3, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. That's a fruit that, well, I can't bear it, can I? Some of these goofy people in our society today calling themselves you know, dogs and cats and whatever else, um, you know what, a, a woman that has ovaries will be able to bear it. I cannot, no matter what I say that I am. But this is a fruit, the fruit of the womb here. Listen to this, Isaiah chapter 13, verse number 18. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. You think of the wickedness in the land that Isaiah is talking about here in Isaiah 13, verse number 18. But the fact of the matter is he refers to the children as the fruit of the womb. That's some fruit that ladies can have that men can't. That God can look down on and He could be very, very happy and satisfied with the way that uh, you have provided for your fruit, if you will, and raised and guided and directed. We can also have the fruit of our very own way, can't we? We consider Proverbs chapter number 1, verses 24 through... 30 it looks like. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 24 says, Because I have called and ye have refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. 
But ye have said it not all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. Verse number 27, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all of my reproof. We consider verse number 31 of Proverbs chapter number 1 that finishes up with saying, Therefore, they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. This is a fruit that as believers, we could choose to participate in. It's our choice. We could live in an evil way if we wanted to. But the fruit that's uh, uh, produced as a result of that is not the fruit that is going to uh, bring our Lord and Savior glory and honor. James 3.17 says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. James 3.17 It's awesome to see that the wisdom from above, one of the benefits of enjoying that is good fruit coming to your account. You consider the, uh, the things that we need to sustain a, a fruit tree. You've got to ha- make sure they have water, amen? You've got to make sure that they have the right kind of nutrients, uh, vitamins, right kind of uh, minerals in, in, in the soil and whatnot. And you know what? As believers in Jesus Christ, we need to understand the wisdom that comes from above as we embrace it and live it out in our lives will produce an amazing fruit that will please our Heavenly Father. But it's our choice as to whether we want to participate in that or not. There's a fruit of a soul winner that I see out there. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse number 30. One of the only verses in the Bible you can read that God uses a measuring stick to tell you what He thinks about an activity. He says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. With our very lips, we could present that tree of life to somebody that doesn't know anything about Jesus Christ. And just because we choose to be obedient and share the Word of God with somebody else, we know that God looks down upon us and says, you are wise as He watches us participate in that. John 15, verse number 8 says, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. God desires for us to bear much fruit. He wants for us to bear much fruit. He doesn't want for us to be idle and and by the wayside, if you will. He wants us to be doing those things that please Him, so when He looks down from heaven above, He can say, well done, Thou good and faithful servant, and he'll know by the fruit that he sees abounding. I'm going to read to you Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 through 20. <coughs> ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so. Every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. You know, as we consider looking around at other people. You know, it's okay to judge righteous judgment based on the Word of God, and you could tell by the fruits that you see in somebody's life whether they're walking with God or not, whether they're striving with God. 
if you know them well enough. I mean, clearly, if it's just a, an acquaintance, you may not have a must, enough information to understand that. But you know what? By their fruits, ye shall know them. There's some key indicators that we can see. If we can see key indicators in other people's lives to understand what kind of fruit's in their life, what do you think people think about our lives when they look at us? And not that it matters what people think. Remember, God sees us as trees, and when He looks down, He wants to see a bunch of fruit on there. This is the creator of the universe. This is the one that went to the cross for us. He gave everything. And He wants to purge us. He wants to prune us. Romans chapter 6, verses 21 and 22. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. You consider the lives that we led prior to salvation. If you, you know, got saved any time after just a few years old, um, you probably had some sinful behaviors that you were kind of getting in tune with. God says there's nothing to at the end of that other than death. There's no fruit that comes from that. As God looks down, there's no fruit. It's just death. Verse 22 of Romans 6, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. It is our great privilege to live for the King of Kings and to do those things that please Him so that He can look down and see the fruit in our lives. You know, like I said, there's a lot of different fruit um, shown to us in God's Word. But there's no better fruit that I see as I consider the fruit in God's Word than found in Galatians chapter number 5. Galatians chapter number 5, verses 22 and 23. If you'll turn over there as we uh, consider this as our uh, last area of Scripture we'll be visiting. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. We consider... As God looks down upon us from up above, as He looks at us expecting to see much fruit in our lives, does He see that precious fruit called love? We consider the great love that God had for us going and giving everything upon the cross of Calvary. And you know what? It started plenty of time before Calvary. You know that, right? We always focus our attention on the cross itself, but you know what? Jesus was walking that road of persecution long before He was hung on that cruel tree. And He showed and demonstrated a love to us that could not be demonstrated by anybody else. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. You know, this is one of the great benefits that God gives us in in being a believer in Jesus Christ. We can experience a joy that not many others can experience unless they know Christ is their Savior. We can live our lives in a way to where we please God. We, We put knowledge and wisdom, His knowledge and His wisdom into our hearts and minds. Um, We begin to agree more and more every single day with Him on how we ought to live based on His Word. And we begin to see some fruit popping up in our lives. You know, normally the first one that we start expressing to people is love. We start telling other people about our salvation. We start trying to give them that gospel message that we received. And we do that because we can even love a perfect stranger now. You know, before I was saved, I didn't care about anybody else. I don't know how it was for you, but I didn't care about anybody else. It was only about me. And when I woke up in the morning to decide what I was going to do, it was because of what I wanted to do. It it had nothing to do with anybody else. But as we consider after salvation and becoming a new creature in Jesus Christ, we consider the great love and how we were transformed in that way. That's normally one of the first fruits that you see in your life. And then, of course, joy. And the Bible goes on to say, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. A peace that passeth all understanding. A peace that you can have that only can be had as a result of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
There's no other way to explain being able to go through turmoil in life and challenges in life and heartache and heartbreak and still have peace. You may be shedding tears while that peace is being exhibited in your heart, but it's a peace that only comes through knowing Jesus Christ. That's a fruit of the Spirit. When God said He desires for us to have much fruit as He looks down upon us, peace is one of those fruit He ought to see hanging from our trees. Galatians 5.22 once again, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. That's one that's not easy for mankind to get, get their heads around. That's why we have so many problems in this world today. Long-suffering is not something easy to deal with. You can be having fellowship with God in prayer, sitting in your car in break time, and somebody can come screeching through the parking lot and slam their brakes on or honk their horn right in front of you. and You could open your eyes out of the throne room of grace. And if you're not careful, you'll start exhibiting the opposite of long-suffering to that person that just scared the daylights out of you because they were on their cell phone you know, while they're cruising the parking lot and thought you were going to die or something. But beyond that, long-suffering is something that only God is able to exhibit at its fullest. As He was long-suffering to us word as we constantly walked away from Him. And I don't mean, I, I do mean us individually, but as a people, as a creation... God's people have constantly walked away from Him. You know, there's only two types of people in this world. It's God's chosen people and the Gentiles. It's the one that He chose to show His promises and His great love to everybody else and everybody else. And you know what? God's people, the chosen people, that He said, I want to be your God, they've been walking away from Him over and over and over. It's demonstrated in the Bible. And God is still long-suffering. He's still long-suffering. You remember as God wanted to take all of them out in the book of Exodus, and Moses said, no. If you're going to do it, blot me out too. You can't do that. Man, what are people going to think? You said your promises are coming and and all these other things, and you know what? (coughs) Praise God for His long-suffering. I'm so thankful I live on the New Testament side. Where God isn't into the just zapping people dead for doing things wrong. I'd have been dead a long time ago. I probably wouldn't be your preacher. He'd have have struck me down a long time ago as I lived in sin. But if it wasn't for His long-suffering, amen? And that's a fruit that can now be exhibited in our lives as we grow closer to God, as we listen to the preaching and teaching of the Word, as we have fellowship and prayer with Him about it, and as we begin to consider God's ways versus our ways, and we soon start to become, uh, in, get into a place where we're in agreement with Him and we start walking with Him. And God can get, bring us to this place where we're long-suffering, where people can do things that are just completely... I remember when I was younger working through the labor strike, the, the uh, grocery stores. This isn't that long ago. 2007, what is that? like? That's a long time ago. My daughter's like, that's a long time ago, right? <laughs> a long time ago. But I remember as a believer, I was managing grocery stores during that time, and, and the whole entire store walked out on me because they had to, because of the union. And I had to bring a bunch of other people in overnight to fill all these different spots in the store. And I was working 20, 22 hours a day in a grocery store. And I had reached, God had used me to reach one of my friends while he was in prison and he got saved. And he had gotten out of prison. He'd still lived a number of years in prison. He was a good friend that I grew up with. Um, After his salvation, he lived out the rest of his term there. And then he gets out. Rob and I, are, God puts on our heart to give him a car. I hire him to work for me. He gets a full-time job. And I remember as the strike was going on, I remember my brother that's a new believer pretty much because he hasn't learned much, and me walking together and people being cruel. You ever been on a picket line? They know you're the boss. Rawr, rawr, rawr. I start going on. It's like walking through it. And my buddy goes, mm, did you hear what they said to you? Like trying to draw out the old man, right? 
That's the opposite of long-suffering, right? You just want to take it out on somebody right away, but you know what? God can teach us to be long-suffering. Galatians 5.22 goes on to say, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and gentleness. The way we treat people. You can't grab people by the collar, amen? It doesn't work like that. You know, you guys are probably going to think this is funny, but when I was in the military, they taught us how to do what's called wall-to-wall counseling. The message was very important that they were giving you. And if you chose not to follow the message, you would be taken to an area for some wall-to-wall counseling. And if you were a leader, you were expected to take your soldier to an area for wall-to-wall counseling. Does wall-to-wall counseling sound good? You, you put the person in a Muay Thai clinch in close quarters, whether it's vehicles or in a room like this, and you drag them off every wall in the whole place telling them they better listen to you better. If you don't, man, it's really going to be on next time, right? But you know what? That's not gentle, is it? Man, how do you think people would feel? I remember it took a long time after I got out of the military before I felt normal. I had a boss that said this, well, you know how to be a drill sergeant, right? Treat your employees like that. Now, I wasn't saved then, okay? Are you guys ready for this? I wasn't saved then. I was wall-to-wall counseling in the grocery store. (laughs) thinking it's the right thing. But you know what? I didn't understand anything. All I knew was how to be a soldier. But you know what? After coming to know Christ as my Savior, I now understand how to be gentle. And I would hope that even though uh, you may want to wall-to-wall counsel somebody, right? You, you agree with God and you say, I ought to be long-suffering and gentle to them. Because that's a fruit of the Spirit. As God looks down from heaven upon us, as He considers the state of our lives and He sees all that greenery uh, flourishing there, He ought to see some fruit and He ought to see some gentleness happening in our life. Goodness. There was a lady today, I was at the store, and you know, you consider the things that we do and just being good to people and expressing God's love and His gentleness and long-suffering. I was just walking across the parking lot, going back to the car, and this lady had a long way to walk to go to the cart return. But I was going that way because my truck was parked right next to it almost anyway. And I said, hey, how's it going today? And she looked at me like, what in the world are you talking to me for? And I said, let me take your shopping cart. I'm going that way. Don't worry about it. And she looked at me like, I was talking a different language almost, like people aren't used to somebody being good to them and being kind and being nice. And it was only a shopping cart. I mean, come on. But you know what? People don't do that anymore. We ought to be able to exhibit the goodness of God and show people the fruit that God has put in our life. We don't have to be rushing around like a bunch of ants like the world. We may be in a hurry, but we got to be looking for those divine appointments that God has set up for us too, don't we? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. We consider the faith that's required to really trust the God that we serve. And you know, as I look at these different things here, considering the progression of God's Word, God puts things in a certain order, I believe, for a reason. It's not like He's taking the shotgun approach like some leaders do in business where they just, wow, and they just throw a bunch of things out there, and however it lands is how we're going to talk about it. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. And man, as this fruit begins to bloom, man, our faith really begins to bloom. And our trust in God. As we see Him working in our lives. And it's, it's always so exciting <clears throat> to talk to other believers when they don't really understand how much of a blessing they're being to me or you as we're talking to them. And they're just simply talking. They're just talking about how good God has been and how they've learned to trust God and how their faith has grown over the years. And it's encouraging to hear because God does that. And as we feed ourselves once again the right nutrients spiritually, feasting on God's Word, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 God desires for us to be devouring His word. As we do that, 
It's going to cause us to uh, uh, bear more and more and more and more fruit. Amen? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. <laughs> meekness is down at the end of the stack. Amen? Because it takes a little while to get there. It takes a little while to... to, to uh, you know, uh, get humble, <laughs> amen, and, and to be willing to, to serve others without having to worry anything. I, you know, the only time I used to serve others before I was saved, you know when it was? When I was going to get something in return. That's how the world does it. But that's not how God does it. <laughs> it's not how He does it. God demonstrated for us in His very own life becoming humble and, and lowly in the face of His own creation. And that is the one that comes to purge us and to help us to, to bear more fruit and more fruit and more fruit. And sometimes we think, man, God, why are you, why are you trying to squeeze this part out of my life? I like it. I enjoy it. I Whatever. He's purging us and He wants us to bring forth more, th more fruit. You ever been listening to a message or reading the Word of God and saying, oh, I've never seen that in there before. I remember reading that. I'm going to read that again. You read it again. The Holy Spirit starts knocking on your door a little bit. Man, I think I need to start doing that. I think I need to do that. He purges us. And there's a lot of different ways that He does it, but the fact of the matter is we need to become accustomed to never saying no to God and simply following what He asks us to do. Knowing that He knows better. I was so discouraged at one point in my, my time in the military where I had a, had a leader in charge of our squad and we had six guys and I was the number two guy and he's the number one guy. And we're on this mission and he's, he's leading us and we're on foot and we got three days to get to where we're going. And about two days into our trip, we get to the top of a ridge and we're spread out. Even though you're traveling with only six guys, you're spread out quite a ways. It's not like there's all six of us, and we get to talk about things, okay? <laughs> he's up in the front, he's telling you where to stop or whether to go, and I'm back towards the back. And we stop for quite a while, and we're, we're on this pretty treacherous you know, mountainside, if you will, and there's a ridge line, and he's unsure whether he needs to go to the right side of the, or the left side of the ridge or the right side of the ridge. And he's up there at the front trying to figure it out with his map, his topographical map, looking at land features. Okay, and I make my way up there. <laughs> Sergeant Heelit, <laughs> one of my best from Buffalo, New York. I get up to the front. He says, "Don't worry about it. I got this." We went to the left, and to go to the left, you got to rappel down. You got to get your ropes, and it's like sixty feet down. So once you go down, you ain't going back up, not unless you're leaving your rope. And a combat engineer never leaves his rope. I'm thinking, really? Like, okay, so we go. We get another about a half a day into the journey and we stop again for quite some time and he realizes he's taking us the wrong direction. You know how many more days it cost us to get to our objective? It was supposed to be three days. We encountered this on day two. It took us seven days to get there because of an error in his way. Jesus Christ will never lead us astray. As He leads and He guides and He directs us, I know that there has been many men and women that have failed me in my life. And we can all say that. It's difficult to, to think that anybody will uh, be just and true like God is. God is absolute and He's perfect. And everybody that we deal with on this planet, none of us are perfect. And we consider the great love that He has for us and the fruit that could be hanging from our tree. And as we get down to the end of uh, verse number 23 of Galatians chapter number 5, the Bible tells us that He'll see temperance in our life. 
Against such there is no law. You consider the fruit of the Spirit that really God desires for us to have hanging from our tree. This fruit of temperance here. You know, I consider somebody that's been a seasoned Christian and has been able to make it through the sequence of this fruit, if you will, and get to this place where they're tempered and they can actually control what they're doing. I don't know who I was talking with this not too long ago about, you know, when you first joined the military, I think it might have been Brother Javi, you know, you're hearing gunfire and bombs going off, C4, whatever it is, and you're, you're like, it's hard not to flinch, you know, you first go in, you're, there's not, that stuff doesn't go on on the streets around here, you know, I know we hear gunshots and stuff, but not the same. But after a while that you've been in, you kind of become desensitized to all of that. And that's why you can go into a hardened battle zone where you know artillery's flying and you got M1s knocking things out and you're you're literally waiting between shells going off so you can have your conversation and then when it goes off again you stop and then you start talking again. We can get to that place where we're not flinching a whole lot about what's going on in our lives. We have so much fruit hanging off our tree. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. We're at that place where and you live the Christian life and you know what? You're always going to be getting purged. Whether it's because you have things in your life that God wants to clean up or because God just wants to help you to grow more fruit next year and you've got to be purged. <laughs> Amen? Consider the fact that God sees us as trees. The Bible says in John chapter 15, verse number 16. Let me read it to you, the whole thing here. John chapter 15, verse number 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in My name, He may give it you. Sometimes when people hear things like this in the end of verse number 16 where God says He's going to give us those things that we ask for, we automatically start thinking about the, the Cadillac or the the, the ski boat or the you know fill in the blank, whatever the shiny object is that you think you're dancing after. But that's not what God's talking about. As our hearts and minds begin to agree with God more and more, we do more and more and more of His will. And if you pray something like this, Lord, I would love to lead somebody to the Lord this next month. I would love to be able to give out the Word of God to somebody this month. Lord, I would love to be able to give the full gospel presentation to somebody this month. Those are the type of prayers that will align with God's will. And as we pray for those type of things, it's much more likely that God is going to answer those prayers for us as we ask for those things that He desires for us to do. As we ask for strength, the Bible says in James 1.5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, whom giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not. God has an endless supply of wisdom, and we know the wisdom that comes from above, it bears much fruit. We need a desire to be into the wisdom of God, amen. It's a nutrient that will feed us <clears throat> like nothing else, feeding on the wisdom of God. We need to bring forth a lot of fruit. Not because we think, you know, life and living as a Christian is some kind of numbers game. The Bible says that he that planteth and he that watereth are one. Amen? I used to be a little bummed out as a young Christian to think that Man, I didn't get to pray with anybody. 
Last month, I didn't get to pray with anybody and, and lead them to the Lord, actually pray with them and show them the Romans road and, and help them understand salvation and pray with them. Man, I didn't get to do that. Somebody said, well, how many times did you give out a track? How many times did you talk with someone about the Lord? How many? And you start considering these things that we do for God, and you know what? Uh, we can't consider that one is more important than the other. They're all the same. We're witnessing for the King. Amen. And just because you maybe haven't been able to pray with somebody recently, you might be doing your part in being able to give out His Word. And you know what? That's the recommendation for praise as far as our King is concerned. Amen. And so part of bringing forth fruit is really letting people know the great love that Jesus Christ has for them. And just simply expressing ourselves to them a lot of times can be very helpful. Just like how we can come to church and talk with each other. And it seems like the words that maybe another believer says to you while you're here had a perfect fit for what you had going on in your life. God creates those same type of appointments for us. That's what I refer to as divine appointments outside of the house of God. Where we are, where we simply get to share our very own testimony with somebody else that we maybe not even know very good. Maybe they're just in the back of a long line somewhere and they're complaining about the line they're in. You've got a captive audience for a little bit. What are you going to do? Are you going to complain with them? Or are you going to use the opportunity and say, Lord, you better give me something. I'm here in the meeting time now. What do you want me to say? God will give it to you. But what a blessing it is when we participate in those things and we can walk away knowing that our God is looking down upon us and saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I see a bunch of fruit hanging off your tree. God looks down, He sees trees. What kind of tree will we be? Amen. Let's take a couple moments before we close in prayer for each one of us to pray individually. If God's challenged you in any way tonight, talk with Him about that. And we'll close in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we love You. And we thank You for challenging us tonight. Thank You for helping us to understand that uh, it doesn't matter where we're walking in life, we are always going to have a season of purging and pruning that's going to happen in our life because You love us and You desire for us to bring forth much fruit. Help us, Lord, to do those things that would bring honor and glory to You. Help us to see those divine appointments that You have set up for us this week. Help us to be encouraged, Lord, as we consider the amazing, faithful leader that you are to us. We love you so very much. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.